we're back and hopefully we are turned the right direction at this time. I was just getting into my Bible study, so let me get into it now. Everybody still with us? Call some folk and tell them we had a little bit of technical problems, but we're going into a very powerful Bible study. I think that's why the enemy's messing with us. Nah, I think we just messed up. So here we go right now. I started out telling you I have a burden from the Lord, and I believe it's going to bless you tonight. Um, I've been watching what's happening with stress and anxiety and the fears that have been going on with believers. And I want to start a Bible study a, a series in this first Bible study of 2022 on how you can get victory over your stress, anxieties, and fears. It's a serious subject. It's a real subject because with all of the things that we're getting inundated with around the world, you need to know what God says about stress, anxieties, and fear. Come on, fess up, be with me tonight, and understand as I go through the study. These are kind of like very uncertain times we're living in, meaning the more we think we know, the less we know. The coronavirus and all the variants and all that you hear on the news, it just gets us all up in the air. It lets us know that the parameters and the conditions of life can change so quickly that people are frightened. The thing I'm finding out is that believers are finding themselves just as stressed out as the rest of the world. And the problem is families are suffering, the church is suffering, and the kingdom of God is suffering when believers buy into the uncertainty of a future, when they buy into the stress the world is given, when they buy into the lie that there's no way we can make it through all of this stuff we're going through. And then I find out that they literally drop out from the church. It's, it's like the restlessness on the inside of them tells them to stay home or tells them that I can't handle this. So a lot of believers find themselves in this place. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but it's like they're in this place where church now has become an option Instead of understanding, it's the only real place of safety. I'm not talking about literal, in-person church. You know, most of us are doing hybrid. We're doing both services. I'm talking about the fact that you got to come to grips that the kingdom didn't stop. Your gift didn't stop. What God wants you to do didn't stop. But we must find ourselves getting from under all of the stress and the anxiety and the fears of what we're living through. Let's, let's, let's make a clean slate to understand that the church was never exempt from these problems. But we have to make sure that we don't allow the enemy to blind our eyes to his goal. The goal of the enemy, he wants to get you so in tune with where am I going, where's my future, what's going on with me, that you forget that there's people out there that need you right now. If there had not been a coronavirus right now, there are people that need you. So let's get into this study. Uh, we all need to learn how not to be stressed out. If you were to, if you were to Google how to handle stress, you come up with, I don't know, 70,000 websites telling you how to handle stress because the reality is the most people agree that 70% of Americans are stressed out, full of anxiety, or full of fears. But we get so arrested by our fears that we just follow whatever these websites say. So there's some good remedies out there. You know, exercise. Exercise is great. It releases those stress hormones when you do physical exercise. It gets to the point where the endorphins come in that put you in a good mood. So exercise is great for being stressed out. Love it. It's one of God's gifts to us to do that to this human body. Also, they tell you get a balanced diet. A balanced diet, nutrition that feeds the body can help with stress. They tell you sleeping, the right amount of hours of sleep can bless us. We wake up full, we wake up, we wake up uh, alert, because, and we can handle some of the pressures that's coming on us. And, you know, we go through all of these things. They tell you that hang out with family and friends. Mindfulness is the latest craze. That mindfulness just means that you are to stay alert and you are to stay sensitized to the moment that you're in and not be reactive, but make sure you stay in that moment so you can keep the stress levels down. 
They tell you get a dog, get a pet. They tell you go hang out with nature. They tell you do some art, meditate, all of that. And you know what? Every one of those are good, but we got a problem. That's what I want to talk about tonight. The problem is usually all these rem remedies just touch the symptoms and not the real cure. That's the symptom. So I can feel good for a little while exercising. I can feel good. Next thing you know, my stress is coming back. I want to teach you tonight how to get the God remedy because through the Bible, there are biblical characters. There's a scripture. There's places where people were going through stressful situations and with God, they made it out. I got help for somebody tonight. No, you don't have to stay like you are. Yes, we all wrestle with anxiety. We all wrestle with stress. But do you believe God has a cure. So let's get to this because the first thing I need you to know is we have to stop getting to the point that we, uh, how do I say, just get caught up and go into this state like, what's going on? We, we kind of freeze because the reality is if you're writing notes, I want you to write this down. Recognize that the Bible has given us all kind of warnings that in this side of life, you are going to have to fight stressful areas. Couple that with spiritual warfare. Couple that with health issues. Couple that with your bills. Couple it with your families. Couple it with your relationships. And you will find yourself stressed out if you don't first say, I'm prepared for what's about to happen. You got to know that when something happens, it's no surprise to God. So if it's not a surprise to you, you'll know that God has said, I'm prepared to get you through this. All I need you to do is lean on me and trust me. Psalms 34 and 4. The psalmist said, I sought the Lord. Listen to what the psalmist said. King David, I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. No, no, David, di didn't you listen to the preachers that told you that we're never supposed to be afraid? Haven't you heard the latest thing that we can name, that we can claim what it is, that we walk around, something's wrong, or we're away from God when fear comes in? Baloney. You need to understand all of us are going to fight these fears, and anybody who tells you they didn't, they're lying to you. Here's King David work, walking in, exercising the gift God gave him, and right in the middle, he said, I had to sought the Lord, I had to seek God, so he could deliver me from my fears. Why are you shocked that you got fears? But the good news, he said, I sought the Lord. That's the only remedy. I want you to know as you get into this to get you some hope, the only remedy for our stress and anxiety is God. Yes, I believe in medication. I told you that. I believe in therapy. I told you that. But without fighting the underlying cause of these things, we're not going to make it. And the Bible is full of what are the underlying causes of our stress, anxiety, and fears. This is going to bless you because we have to listen to what Peter said. Peter. Many of us can identify with the flaws and the, the stuff that Peter did. And many of us got some secret, you know, kind of Peter moves in us. But 1 Peter 5 and 7 says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Settle it. Psalmist said, I got fears. Settle it. I'm going to have anxieties. But the good news is I can cast them on God. The problem is when you sit there and act like it's the end of the world when you get the anxiety. The reality is, I know I got to wrestle with it. So I'm in a fight right now. I'm in a fight for the next 15 minutes. I'm in a fight for the next 20 minutes. I'm in a fight for the next two days. Whatever it is, I need you out there to realize you have to fight through. The, the Bible tells us we're going to have fears. David said, the psalmist said, First Peter, Peter said, you're going to have some anxiety. So don't sit around acting like you're this great saint who never has to deal with this. All of us, if we're going to be truthful, has to wrestle through these situations. And 2 Corinthians, I'm getting to Paul. I use these all as, as examples because these are the people we look to, but they could not do what they did if they didn't understand that I'm going to have to fight through these falls, this spiritual warfare that's happening in my life and not settle for it. I can do all the other things, but I must Stick with the word of God. 2 Corinthians 1 and 8. Listen to Paul as he's doing his missionary journeys. Look what he said to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians 1 and 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant or unaware, brothers, of the afflictions which we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened 
beyond our strength that we despaired for life itself. It, is that Paul talking about being so burdened, so stressed out, so full of anxiety that he despaired for his own life? Paul said this happened, hello, while I was doing the Lord's work. Can I get a witness? While I was doing the Lord's work, this happened to me. I can confess. Anybody out there worth their salt? Anybody out there with some victories under their belt? Put it in the chat. Let somebody know. You do not see me standing here without a battle. We're the folk that had the battle today just to get where you are right now. Let people know this is the norm. I'm prepared, but I got a God who is greater than what I'm going through. The last one is there's several categories of Psalms. Uh, I did a teaching on the Psalms, and you know that um, there are wisdom psalms, there are thanksgiving psalms, uh, there are prophetic psalms, and um, there are psalms that talk to us about uh, lament. And the lamented, the lamenting psalms are the psalms that are talking about the times of grief and sorrow and struggle. And the psalms or songs which give us and bring us close to the Lord. One of the greatest songs and hymn writers in the Bible, in the Word, was David. And look at, I want you to see what David wrote in Psalms 13, verse 1. This, this psalm, by the way, Bible scholars say that this psalm is David working hard for God, but God seeming distant. Ever been there? Working hard for God, but can't see the benefits of working hard for God. David said, how long, O oh Lord? There's a lot of how longs in this psalm. Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul? Watch this. And have sorrow in my heart all day long. David said, I had sorrow in my heart all day long. How long shall the enemy be exalted over me? How long shall it look like I'm losing? Consider and answer me, O God. Oh, Lord, my God, light up my eyes. David was saying, give me a way to see my deliverance, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. David is letting us know. I, I got to set the tone of this. Please, you cannot sit here all shaking and acting like you know you're going to die. No, God has already kept you. But if you have an awareness that this is coming, you'll be able to keep yourself. So whatever is attacking you now, all you have to remember is, first of all, I knew that was coming. So I'm not going to act crazy like this is the end of the world, like something's wrong with me. I'm going to fight it because I'm going to face it. And now I'm going to let God do it. So let's get into our study today. You, you, you need to understand I'm going to several Bible passages that deal with several principles and ways that God has given us to deal with stress and anxiety. And each one will address a remedy that will give you some relief and comfort as you're going through what you're going through. Hello, watch this. It's so important. So first, I need you to open your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 14, to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Grab your phone, grab your devices, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. We're going to go through a little verse by verse, but we will see the overall power of this psalm, excuse me, of this chapter, and how it fits into the main, what I call the number one principle that we need to understand to make sure we can handle the stresses, the anxieties, and the fears in our life. John 14, are you there with me? I'm going to begin reading, and I'm going to read about three or four verses, so go with me. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, that you may, the way you know. All right, let's stop there. The number one, I believe, reason, saints are quaking, shaking, losing their footing, drifting away from God, laying back off their gifts, 
not standing strong in the midst of this battle is because the number one reason that we can get to a root cause of anxiety is when you don't trust in the sovereignty of God. Do you trust God to run your life? Think about what I'm saying. If you're standing in now so confused and moving in such a direction, then it must mean you think God is taking a break. It must mean you think God cannot handle what you're going through. It must mean you think that somehow, which the word says contrary, that God is a respecter of person. Somehow you think that God's going to let me, after bringing you all this far, you think somehow God's going to let you go under. No, the only person who can let you go under is you. This psalm, this passage of scripture, I'm stuck on the psalms, will let you know that God is a God who comforts his people in their worst hour. This passage that you're used to, let's look at it in context and you will see the sovereign hand of God to bring comfort. But you got to know, if God's running your life, what are you fearful about? If God is the one who has his hands on you, why are you sitting there acting like you're about to lose it? If God is the one who brought you this far, why are you feeling like I need to give up? Give up for what? God still has a plan, but you have to first nestle yourself, put yourself into the understanding that my God is sovereign. I'm going to tell you what sovereignty means so you can know that since the sovereign God is running my life, I put my faith there that I am going to be all right. Somebody say that with me. Put it in the chat. I'm going to be all right. So what? The stress is there. God will keep me through the stress. So what? The fears are there. God will take those fears away. So what if I get anxious every now and then? Well, I'm going to take you, when you get this scripture in you, you'll understand that you can go from, because, you know, anxiety can go from, you know, just sleepless night to a full-blown anxiety attack. But I'm going to show you how God can, this, can slow that down, and you can get to the place where you're in control. Look at this verse. We've seen this scripture many, many times, but do you know and understand how this scripture is built up? The first thing is, John 14 comes on the hills of John 13. John 13, we need to understand what has transpired. In that 13th chapter, it's where we have Jesus having the last supper with his disciples. In that last supper, do you realize I don't want to go there because I'd be stuck. It's a powerful chapter. The disciples are at this point hearing some things that are sending fears through their body. When they get into this, it's a lonely place. It's a dark place. It's almost as if Jesus is hiding. They lost their whole, uh, it's been, they've been disillusioned, thinking that there was going to be an earthly kingdom. And Jesus shifts now with all the power to letting them know this is our last supper together or we're going to fellowship together. So get the picture. John is laying on his breast. They're sitting around. You've seen the picture of the last supper. And in that, Jesus gives Knowing that all, everything was done, that's a, a dispensational terminology in, in John 13. He gets up, puts a towel on his arm, walks around, begins to wash the disciples' feet. Then he tells them, what you've seen me do, you do also. Don't have time to go there, but understand the power in serving other people. So he gets up, and you know, Peter says something, watch this too, and he tells Peter, no, Peter, you got to have a part with me. And then he tells them, one of you is going to betray me. And he says, it's the one who I dip and sop with. When he sopped and dipped, he gave it to Judas. So they all knew Judas had done it. One translation of the gospel says, go out and do quickly what you've done. And then he leaves out of the room. Judas flees out. And that's when Peter said, well, the disciples start saying, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And leave it up to Peter. Peter said, uh, Lord, I'll never forsake you. That's when Jesus told him, Peter, before the crow cries three times, you're going to, I mean, twice, you're going to actually um, betray me three times. And then they go down and they hear betrayal. They hear darkness. They hear Jesus saying all of this. And their hearts are getting lower and lower. Enter chapter 14. As we look at him going to this chapter saying, but now, since you're in this place, let me comfort you. Stop. Get that. If you've ever heard the voice of God, what God is always around saying to you, since you're in this place, let me comfort you. God does that. Take my, you go into the word, you'll find out he does it. 
Then he breaks this chapter down into four passages of comfort. He said, let me comfort them while they're going through this so they don't lose it. And that's what he's doing to us. While you're in this pandemic, while we're in this time, this position, God is saying, let me comfort you so you understand I still got you. First, he talked about the Father's house. You can write it down if you're writing. Then he talks about the way, the truth, and the life. Then he talks about the comforter that he leaves with us. And then he talks about the eternal necessity of what he was about to do. I'll say it again. He talks about the Father's house in this text. He talks about the way, truth, and life. Powerful, which is establishing his sovereignty. He talks about the comforter. Then he talks about eternal security. Let's go through this. Go to the first verse. It says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. It was encouraging because the first thing Jesus said, while you're going through the anxiety, while you're going through the fear, while you're going through the struggle, first thing you should hear God saying is, don't let this happen. Now, it may sound strange that God is saying, just don't let this happen, you know, but what God is saying, he wasn't Nancy Reagan saying, you know, just say no. What he was telling you is, I believe, I know the capacity that's in you will allow you to not let the trouble in your heart or the trouble that's surrounding you get into your heart. When the trouble gets into your heart, oh, I hear somebody, that's when you change your direction. That's when you lose your hold on God. When the trouble displaces the comfort of God in your heart, all the scripture you read, all the praising you've done, all the singing you've done, all the shouting. Come on, remember the tears coming down. God, I'll never leave you. God, I'm with you. But when that can be just pushed aside by your trouble, the heart now is empty instead of full. But because Jesus said it, what he's saying is, if you have ever heard my voice, if you have ever Ever. I know in you there's a time when you can look back and know that you heard my voice. And if you're used to obeying my voice, then the trouble is not stronger than my word. This is what God said. Let not your heart be troubled. Here's what he's saying. If you're the saint that's used to hearing and obeying me, then you have the ability not to let your heart be troubled. You say, why, Pastor? Because he said it. Jesus' word said it. So no matter what it looks like on the outside, do I have a witness? No matter how troubled I feel, I can't let the feelings, I'm going to help somebody, I can't let the feelings or the, the where I'm at right now, I can't let the darkness, I can't let what I'm going through stop me from hearing the voice of God saying, I'm not happy when you're troubled. So because of who you are, because you belong to me, you can stop it if you're used to hearing my voice and obeying you got to train yourself to hear the voice and obey, even in adverse situations. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, you remember when Peter and the fishermen had been fishing all night long, but they had been with Jesus a while, and all of a sudden, they had, you know, they were expert fishermen, they knew their trade. Jesus comes out after they've toiled all night long and says, cast your nets down for, you know, another catch. And they look around. I can imagine no fish were in the net. We've been there all day. Watch me. Trouble's going on. I got God's word, but nothing's happening. Because you got to hear it and obey it. Watch this. In verse 5 of Luke chapter 5, Peter said, Although we have toiled all night, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down my net again. That's the key. Nevertheless, no matter what's going on, when I hear the word, when I find a word that is supposed to relieve me, I will obey the word when God says that you should have joy, unspeakable joy. You say, but my right now, mentally and emotionally, I'm depressed. Right now, you don't know, it seems like nothing good is happening in my life. Right now, it seems like I can't sleep at night. Right now, I'm going through problem after problem after problem. God said, okay, cool. That's all on the outside. But don't let your heart be troubled. Here's what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15, 16, Jeremiah was always prophesying against the other prophets because he had to do what God says. If you ever want to see a prophet that obeyed God, and he suffered for it. Jeremiah is that prophet. And in Jeremiah 15 and 16, he said, God, he'd been prophesying 
uh, that they were going to go into bondage. All the other prophets said no. He had been placed in the prison. Jeremiah found himself alone. And all of a sudden, Jeremiah sitting there, God gave him a good word, you know, said, I'm going to be with you in exile. And then that 16th verse, it says, God, watch this. Here it is. I found those words and I ate them. And they were words of joy and rejoicing. Where? To my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord of hosts. Don't get lost on that. You have the Lord of hosts, the God who is fighting. When you're too weak to fight because of a physical malady, when you're too weak to fight because mostly and mentally you're drained, keep going with the word. Let not your heart be troubled. He said, keep continue going with the word. And when you find a word, how many know I found a word and then that word allowed me to get some sleep. I found a word and that word reminded me that my God is always trying to comfort me. And you learn to take your comfort in God. So the first thing this text tells us is that when God is comforting us, learn how to be the kind of person that takes his word and obeys it. And then he tells you why you should do that. I love it. He said, let not your heart be troubled if you believe in God. Wow. If you believe in God. We're again testing this theory. Do you really think God is sovereign? Believe in God and believe in me also. Look at the offices he's saying to you. Jesus is saying to, this, to them, he said, first of all, place your confidence in God. Is your confidence in God? In the God you know has given you mercy. In the God you know has shown you grace. Why in the world would you think now that you can't put your confidence in the God who has loved you like he's loving you? You know what the world tried to tell you? Some distorted Christians. Oh, you're weak. You don't have any faith. Yeah, you do. But some days you fight for it. You clump. You got to get out there and say, my mind is overrun. My, my, my family is overrun. My health seems bad. Everything's going wrong. But I'm fighting to hold on to my faith. Here's what he said. Believe. Action word. In the imperative. Believe. He didn't give you a choice. He said, don't, you can't, he said, There's, you can't even be my believer without, you can't even be my servant without believing. So at that moment when you're believing, the question is, what do you believe? You believe what you're hearing from the word of God? Do you believe what the enemy is whispering in your ear? The failure, the defeat, the darkness, you're going to die, you're going to be sick forever. Do you buy into that or have you learned how to believe what God says? You cannot believe them both. You got to tell yourself, that's a, we want to be schizophrenic about our belief system. It's like when I'm happy, oh, this is good. But you got to quit trying to mix faith with sight. Even when it costs you. It's going to cost you to sit there and believe God. It was going to cost these disciples. Look what he said. Believe in God and believe me he said believe first of all that God is the creator believe also that God your father loves you understands you have confidence in you that God can bless you he said but then also when you believe in the father know that he believes in you Ooh, write that down the prodigal son I think about that who went out and was the epitome of someone who said I've been trusting God, so I'm going to step out here and do my thing. And then, because, you know, i got good times going, then when trouble came, he found himself in a pig pen. Remember I told you God is the only true source of redemption? All those friends that were, you know, drinking down the beers and going to the bars with him and all those women that were hanging on him while he had a pocket full of money and all those people that were letting him stay in the five-star hotels, all of that ended when stuff ended. Aren't you glad when stuff runs out in your life, when you don't smell good, God still sticks by you? And that's the blessing of God. But the prodigal son, I want you to see the words he said. When he found himself in the pig pen, it came to him. He had to believe that his father was Because what the words he said was, even my father's servants have it better than this. I'll go back and just be a servant. Look at what the prodigal son said. He believed in his father, even though he was disobedient to his father. He knew that if he turned around, his father still had help. All I'm saying to you, no matter how many times you've been out on a limb, you know that if you turn to your father, he's still there to help you. 
God said, believe in me. Then he said, believe in uh, Jesus. He said, believe in me as the mediator. What is he saying? Um, believe what your eyes have seen. Okay, now you're, you're believing what you're feeling. You believe, and it's real. There's real depression. There's real anxiety. There's real fears. They're real. But you remember, you are a tripart being. You're, you're spirit, soul, and body. You're, your spirit can override those things that are going on. So now Jesus is saying, believe that I'm the Messiah. That's what he was saying to the disciples. Believe I'm that meteor. Believe what your eyes have seen. You saw me open blind eyes. You saw me heal crippled folk. You saw me raise Lazarus from the dead. You saw 5,000 get fed. Let's forget those kind of miracles, which are good sight miracles. But think about what you've already seen God did. You've seen God keep you when you could not be kept. You've seen God change your life just by you coming to him. You've seen the Lord know the worst about you and still hold on to you and hug you as hard as he can. You've seen God do miracles. Everybody on this line who is a believer has seen God do a miracle. And the only reason I say who is a believer, because unsaved folk can't see through spiritual eyes. But with your spiritual eyes, you ought to know that you know that you know God did a miraculous. And he's saying, Jesus said, now, if you know you got saved, then you know I'm the Messiah and you know that it's me. He said, so believe in the Father, believe in me. And then he, 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 he was comforting them. So he said, okay, the world's getting bad. Look where he goes in verse 2. But in my Father's house. Are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Look at verse 4, and you know the way and where I am. He said, All right, so the world is crowding you out down here. Watch me, but hold on to one thing. You're going to make it because I prepared a place for you. In my father's house. Your job is just to hold on till you get to the place I prepared for you. Trust me, you won't get there any sooner. I'm in control of everything going on in your life. So trust me and know that even if you go through this anxiety, this fear, this struggle, it could be, and somebody can testify, it could be a couple years. But if you get strong enough to know at the end of this job, all Jesus was trying to let them see is, Nothing on this side can hurt you. I'm about to go away. And I know that, you know, the Romans are going to come after you. And I know they're coming after my disciples. But you got a hope. You got a hope in the future. You got a hope that the world can't see. You got a hope because I'm always preparing for whatever you have to go through. And then I'm going to take you at the end of all of this. I'm going to take you to my father's house. I got a place prepared. So listen, if you got a place prepared, it means all I got to do is get through this. You know, I used to tell people, get through one second at a time, one minute at a time, 10 minutes, 30 minutes. All that's good. But there ought to be a time when you've grown up, when you can walk through a situation and just ignore the pain by casting it on God and just believing God will keep the rest intact. The devil can tell you, you're having a heart attack. The devil can tell you, you know this is bad. You're getting ready to get this and you're going to be senile. He, he'll tell you anything to stop you from using your gift. And so we get restless and wonder. I, I, I've seen so much, I've talked to so many of my pastoral brothers, how a lot of people are defecting. And I tell people that God, God always tells us, and this is what a real friend is, uh, a friend is a friend in the time of trouble. It's like, you need to know that God is saying, hang in there, I got something for you, I want you to stay on the wall. I want you to trust me. So this anxiety, this fear, this struggle is just the devil bringing spiritual warfare. But you're stronger and greater than that because he says you always have that hope. Wow. At the end of all of this, I still get God. Devil, you can do your worst. I still got my father. I have a destiny. This destiny means if I got to go through struggling Watch what I said. I'm still going to get through even if I get through. Watch this. Tell me this answer. And this is true. Your worst time, maybe you spent two or three days worrying about something. Worrying about uh, your COVID test. <laughs> worrying about, did I catch it? Worrying about, will I die? Will I go to the hospital? Worrying about your children. Worrying about how you're going to pay your bills. 
worrying about is my job going to shut down, worrying about everything and struggle. And the whole time you were doing that, God was sitting there saying, I'm the one carrying you. I can carry you if you would drop the worry. The, when I carry you through it, it would be a lot more pleasant. Here's what God's telling me when he said, I go to prepare a place. I'm going to get you to my father's house. I'm going to give you a hope so you don't have to worry about what this world gives. Uh, one time we were coming back, uh, I would have to ask my wife, I think it was Florida, when the plane was overbooked or it got filled up. And so we were in the airport not knowing what was going on. They wanted people to give up their seats. And we were one of the ones that we had booked later than other folks. So we were sitting around after going through the airport. Seems like every time we go to the airport, they pull us aside for that extra security. They had pulled us aside for extra security on the way to Florida, pulled us aside on the way back from Florida. We're sitting there, and I'm waiting, in the, waiting to see what was going on. It got late. It was miserable. Then they had to put us up in a hotel. We had to decide, well, we can't go to sleep because if we go to sleep, we, might miss our, we don't want to miss our plane. And it was just getting further. So the sleep wasn't good. The rest wasn't good. The next day... After going through all of that, and you know, I'm, I'm, it's not as bad as it was now. But we finally got on the plane. We just couldn't wait to get home. We had one more ordeal. There was a connecting flight. And now, when we were getting to the airport, we got back to Philly. Philadelphia Airport. And all of a sudden, there was a calm coming over. And I thought about something, which you and I all, you can identify with me. Vacations are great. Trips are great. But there's that one moment during that trip. Where you say, I can't wait till I get back home. Here is what carried us through that ordeal. We knew once we landed and we drove our car to our house, the place that we had, that we were going to get us some rest and all of this was going to be behind us because we had a home which gave us a hope that this won't last forever. God is telling you, you got a home, so this won't last forever. So you got to understand that God is saying, make sure you realize when you're going through this, quit buying into that instant. Look at verse 5. Thomas said, Thomas, and we understand who Thomas was, right? Thomas said, uh, Lord, we do not know, verse 5, where you are going and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father, verse 7. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Powerful. Let's put all of that. I mean, let's unpack. Look what he said. Thomas said to him, we know Thomas. Thank God for Thomas' honesty. Thomas said, all that talking, the rest of the disciples might not have understood what Jesus was saying. But Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know where you're going? How can we know the way to where you're going? Thomas was thinking naturally. So Jesus had to bring him back to one of the most powerful statements in all of the Bible. He said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What Jesus was saying is, and it's a great place for us to see and understand his sovereignty. First look at the comfort comes in that. Jesus said, wait a minute, you got this mixed up. I am, I am, this statement is one of Jesus' seven I am statements. But I am, in the Greek says, I and only I myself, is, it's, it's a very uh, a hard saying, it's an exact saying. It's saying, I am the only one. Nobody else had ever said before Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life, because nobody else before God is the way, the truth, and the life. So what he said is, I am this. It, it mirrors the I am statements of, of God throughout the Bible. Remember, Jesus is God. What he's saying is, I came down, I'm the incarnate God, so I speak for God because me and my Father are one, as he said here. So since you know I'm God, I have the only way, I have the only truth, I have the only life. Here's what he said. I am Remember, remember when uh, Moses went to God and Moses said to him, this is God's Yahweh name. He said, I am, I am the God of Isaac and Jacob and Abraham. He was letting him know, 
I'm the only one who can make this statement. What I'm saying to you, this statement clarifies God's sovereignty because God didn't, Jesus didn't say, I am a way. He said, uh-huh, I'm the way. I'm the way. Not I have a way. I'm the way. I don't have some truth. I am the only truth. Nobody else can say that except the sovereign God. I am the only life you can have. Let's talk about it so you understand what he's saying. Jesus was saying, uh, if you remember John 8, 58, if you can write it down, when the scribes and Pharisees, John 8, 58, when the scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus, and, you know, at times he couldn't tell them things that they wouldn't understand. You and I have a better context to understand after all we know about the Bible and all that's been written. But Jesus made a statement in John 8 and 58. He said, before Moses, watch this, he didn't say I was, he said, I am. He used that common language again, saying, you must not know the power that I have. I am the way. He said, what does that mean to us practically? What it looks like, another way is easier, is still not the right way. When it looks like God's way is harder, it's still not the right way. When it looks like what the people are saying, and when people are against you, when you're trying to go God's way, God is saying, my way is the only way to get to what you need. Watch me. Stop, because we're talking about anxiety. We're, we're talking about um, fears. We're talking about anxiousness. So here's what he's saying. Struggle. Here's what he said. In reality, whatever you do is not going to bring you the added results, except you do what I say in my word, because I'm the way. So if you really want comfort, sitting around whining about it, and running around is not going to do it. But if you follow the way that I lay out in my word, you will get blessed. I'm the way. If, if you're broke, I'm the way to prosperity. There's other methods out there, but that's fleeting and empty. You want solid, rock prosperity? You got to trust me because I will give you a prosperity that reaches through natural means and give you a supernatural prosperity. If you want peace, there's the things in the world that give you peace. Paycheck Friday. Might give you peace. Um, coming home and taking a nice hot bath and getting a nice meal. Eating your favorite dessert might bring you a moment of mm, peace. But in the end of the day, that's not permanent. But God said, I'll give you peace in the middle of heading up for surgery. I'll give you peace in the middle of your family falling apart. I'll give you peace when you're broken and don't know how you're going to make the next two hours. After you make it through those two hours, I'll give you a supernatural peace that will allow you to sleep the whole night through. God said, this peace, he said, I'm the way. If you trust me, I'm the way to everything that you need. Some of God's ways seem harsh. I'll give you an example. All of us can identify. Forgiveness. Somebody is getting on your last nerves, treating you unfairly, doing stuff to you. And God says, even if they did it, forgive them. You might decide to take another route. That's the way. You might say, well, like we always like to say, uh, yeah, I was taught it's better to say nothing if you can't say nothing good. God said, okay, cool, but your heart just wasn't changed. You didn't just do what I said. That way is not going to bless you ultimately. One day there's going to be a reckoning where you have to realize, man, the only way I can get from under this burden is to forgive that joker. Excuse me. That person. That saint of God. Only way I can get over that is to forgive him. God, but it don't feel. My flesh don't want to forgive. My mind don't want to forgive. The world says I'm crazy to forgive. But I'm not following the world. I'm following the way. And if I get used to following the way, I'll get blessed by God. Then Jesus went into another, one of the most powerful things. I am the truth. I am, the, I am truth. There is no such thing as truth besides me. He said the world will confuse you because, you know, I know saints that say, um, well, God told me. I'm not saying he didn't. I'm saying, but does it line up with his word? I'm saying if that truth violates God's principles, how do you know you just didn't tell yourself? Not trying to be hard, but because God's truth is synonymous with his word and you know what I'm saying is true some of y'all right now I feel it spirit of God is telling you the truth 
hurts. The truth pulls me in a direction I don't want to go. The truth makes me stand up and be who I don't want to be sometimes. The truth means I leave my comfort zone. But the truth is the only way to get to the power of God. He said, I am. What am I talking about? Samson was strong, pretty, handsome, long hair, a woman, chick magnet. Samson decided to follow God halfway. He said, well, I know the truth that I'm a judge and I'm supposed to lead my people, but I'm going to act in some of my truth and some of God's truth. Sounds familiar? So my truth says, you know, I know I'm supposed to only marry an Israelite, but I've seen a fine Philistine woman. Go get it for me. So I'm going to use my muscles. Now, when it's time to do some God stuff, you know, I'll get out there and I'll do my God thing, you know, and I'll help God. Come, Lord, help me, bless me. That's how we live. We live with our truth until we're in a problem where we have to call God's truth. Don't you turn me off because it's getting to you. Listen to me. God's truth says Samson paid for at the end of his life. He killed a lot of Philistines, but he paid for at the end of his life for not living God's truth the whole time. Can you imagine what we miss and what we lose when we live our truth instead of God's truth? And here's how you know you're living your truth, because you know in your heart you don't even want to put it up to the mirror of God's word because it'll tell you you're wrong. And resent when someone tells you you're wrong. I am the way. I am the truth. And here's the third one, which is powerful. He said, I am life. I'm the source of all truth. I got the only path. Remember, remember in Acts um, where it says, when I think it was Peter was preaching, he said, Acts 4.12, said Jesus Christ is the only way by which a man be saved. He's the only way that we can be born again. He's the only way because he has a divine truth that leads to a divine life from God. Listen to what it says about the life, and I love this verse. It says, Jesus has been telling his disciples about his impending death. And then he tells them, but remember, stay with me. If I don't die, there is no life. They, they won't, they don't understand that full plan then. You know, when he comes back and he talks to them, when the power hits them in the book of Acts, you know, he spends 40 days, you know, after coming out of the grave, he's teaching them some things that they can see now. And we can see that in their power in the book of Acts. But what he was telling them is, uh, because I live, you will live. You're really dead. Dead people have no life. So when you're walking around wondering why there's no joy, it's probably because you're not walking in his life. And if we walk in our life, our life leaves us dead to the power and truth of God. In John 14, 19, he said, yet a little while the world will see me no more, but I. But you will see me because I live, you live. John 14, 19. He was letting them know this paradox is all your life hinges in my life and my life for you gets fuller when I die. And now you become what we just glimpsed in those I am statements. What I'm going to end with tonight is God's sovereignty. Follow me. Jesus said, I'm the only one qualified to say, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Know why? Because he's sovereign. Understand what sovereign is. Sovereignty is he is sovereign over all creation. That means he does what he wants. He's always in control. You would not be fearful if you knew the sovereignty of God, because a sovereign God loves you. A sovereign God is not going to let you get burnt out. A sovereign God is not going to leave you to go through that. But if you don't follow his way, his truth, and his life, he can't save you. Watch this. Sovereign means he is a ruler. It is, again, his lordship name. He has to be lord of your life. When you hear somebody say in, in uh, uh, medieval times that he is the sovereign of this land, that means he's the ruler. He's the king. He's the Lord of this land. But four components go with God's sovereignty. Write this down quick because we don't have much time, but it will bless you. The first component is, it means that God is in control. 
First, first the name factor. That's the first one. I'm sorry. Second one is God is in control. Second one is his third one is his authority. The fourth one is his covenant or his presence. I'm gonna say it again. His name. His name always speaks of his power. It always speaks of his sovereignty. Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh, Jehovah. All of that speaks to who he is. So we don't have to dwell on those. We'll do the names. I want you to understand these other three. His control, his authority, and his covenant presence. His control means that, here it is. Here's a big one that relieves your stress. Everything happens according to God's plan. Even when we screw it up. That's why the Bible says all things work together for good. Now, when we screw it up, God can straighten it up, but not without harm to us. We still have the consequence. Remember what the Bible says? Um, that whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. There's still going to be some reaping, but God is going to make sure you get where you need to get. So why not get there stress-free? Why not get there fighting your stress than getting there all stressed, stressed out when you know God's going to get me there? Somebody, I need you to write in the chat, God's going to get you there. He's going to get you to the place that your mind is at peace. He's going to get you to the place that's what's stressing you. He's going to bless you through. He's going to, he's going to get you there. You know why? Because he is in control. So if he's in control, who should you be appealing to? Him. When Moses met God at the burning bush, the most powerful thing Jesus, God said to him is, um, I know Pharaoh is not going to let you go, but I'm going to come down with a strong hand. Think about that. Pharaoh had an army. Pharaoh was the biggest known ruler in the world at that time. The Egyptians had nothing but mud and bricks. He said, but my hand. Oh, God, hand. God's hand is on your life. That should mean when you lay down, you see the stress leaving because you know he's in control. And you know what he did? Egypt did not leave until after God took control. So what does that mean? God's in control. I'm going to help you with the stress. The three Hebrew boys said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if we go into the fire, we're not going to bow. They knew something that you and I didn't know, but I hope you know after this teaching. Even in the fire. Even under stress, even with the anxiety run, even with the sleepless night, God is still there. What God is saying is, I'm in control, so whatever they think is going to happen to you because of what they do to you, I won't let happen. Because they thought they were going to burn up, but they didn't burn. They thought that uh, if Mordecai, Haman could build a uh, gallows for Mordecai, right? He was, you know, Haman, when all the Jews did in the book of Esther, he built the gallows for Mordecai. He ended up hanging on it. Why? Because God is in control. So even if the devil's preparing your death, God is in control of life. Write this down. The next thing, his authority. God's sovereign lordship means that he has authority. I'll tell you a quick story about authority. Then I got to move to my last point. Um, I was given a ticket for using my cell phone. And I wasn't. I was coming around the corner, and I have hands-free in my car. I tried to tell the officers, I got hands-free, sir. All I was doing was cutting my phone, make sure my phone was connected so I could use my hand-free. I was at a light. He gave me a ticket anyway. We got to court. I pleaded not guilty. So out there in the field, I had to obey the authority of the police officer. When he pulled me over, I had to give my license. I had to do what he said. I took the ticket. But when I got to court, there is another authority higher than a police officer. So when I got there, I gave him my evidence. He listened to both sides. I gave him my evidence, and he downgraded. I still got a ticket because I shouldn't have picked the phone up, but I didn't get the fine that I was going to get by the officer. He downgraded it because at the end of the day, even though the enemy looks like he can maneuver us, he still got to go before the judge. And the judge is God. And God said, I'm the one who gets the last say. So God's authority trumps whatever you're going through. Say that. If the doctor said no, if the sickness looked bad, God's authority is greater. The last thing is, okay, we're going through the four things of God's sovereignty, right? Remember what I said. He can do what he wants, when he wants. That we need to understand his name always talks about his sovereignty. His control talks about his sovereignty. And also his authority. But the last thing is the most important as we close, his presence. Genesis 17:7. He said, I'm going to establish a covenant with you and make you my covenant people. He said, and once I establish that covenant, here's a term. I'll never leave you. 
God, you won't leave me when I'm stressed out. I'll never leave you. You won't leave me when I've left you mentally and emotionally because I can't handle it. I'll never leave you. My presence will always be with you. Write this scripture down. Psalm 16 and 11. Psalm 16 and 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there's pleasures evermore. God said, in my presence there's fullness of joy. So you can stay in God's presence while you're going through and you'll still have a full joy. And finally, Exodus 33 and 14. And he said, my presence will go with you and I we're going to keep looking at this next week, guys. Don't miss this. Uh, I told you I got a burden from God because I've been going through some stressful things myself. And, and as a pastor, you can go look it up. Pastors leaving the ministry and, and, and save folk who are finding themselves at the end of their rope. we got to find a way to deal with our anxieties, our stresses, and our fears. we got to get victory. You know what victory is? Victory is not this little elusive thing people talk about. Victory is when I can handle it. And let God be in control. I will have the victory. Come on, send me a note if this teaching blessed you. Send this teaching on to someone else on your own Facebook. Come on, you and I both know the day we're living in. There's people that need the teaching about how to get victory. All the other stuff is good, but God is the reality, the only source. We're going to talk next week over how to, we're going to finish this text, how to get victory over your stresses, your anxieties. Pastor Duncan saying, love you, God bless you, have a great night.